I'm going to read to you out of uh, the message paraphrase. And uh, uh, I just like it because it speaks um, basically and it echoes what I want to say. So here's what the Bible says. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Keep a cool head. Turn your neighbor and say, be cool. Stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce. Somebody say, uh-oh. And would like nothing better than to catch you napping. Keep your guard up. You're not the only ones plunged into these hard times. It's the same with Christians all over the world. So keep a firm grip on your faith. Turn your neighbor and say, hold on to it, hold on to it, hold on to it. The suffering won't last forever. It won't be long before this generous God who has great plans for us in Christ. Eternal and glorious plans they are. will have you put together and on your feet for good. He gets the last word. Yes, he does. Say it with me. Say, yes, he does. Say it one more time. Yes, he does. One more passage of scripture, Luke 22, verse 31. Here's what the Bible says. Simon, Simon, these are Jesus' words. Behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But, say it with me, say but. But "But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Somebody say amen to the word of God. I want to speak to you this morning from just this thought. And before you have a seat, don't have a seat yet, but just remember this so you can write it down. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, I thank you, Lord, that it is you that reveals Jesus to us through your word. So I pray, Lord, for divine revelation. We seek to meet with you today, God. Have your way in us, Holy Spirit, not just for the next... A few minutes that that I share the word, Lord, but for an eternity. We give our hearts to you. We submit our hearts to you today, Lord. We are here from you. Come do what you do. We honor you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Go ahead and have a seat. I'm a, uh, I've been in a, in, a, in a series that I've entitled Living Hope, and we've We've been in First Peter for the past uh, four weeks. Last week, when we were at men's camp, I heard the preacher of all preachers preach the house down. She is by far my favorite preacher in all of the world. And uh, um, she preached a message on holiness. And, and before you sit there and go, ooh, because most of us, when we hear holiness, it just kind of rubs us the wrong religious way, so to speak. She, me- she preached a message on holiness that you ought to hear. Fellas, if you missed last Sunday, go to the YouTube page. You'll find it on there. She preached an amazing word on holiness, and I pray that that becomes something that, that you and I uh, run with. That is a word from the Lord God, and it's a, it's a, it's a divine word. And, and, and so this theme of living hope in First Peter, just to give you some context, Peter wrote this letter to Gentile Christians, people that were not Jewish, that were not uh, from Jerusalem, people from an outsider's perspective, so to speak, who now believe Jesus, started following Jesus, and because of their belief, they've been persecuted. They're enduring suffering. There's pain that's involved. I know none of y'all can relate to that. Nobody knows what pain is like. Nobody knows what suffering is like. Nobody knows what choosing the right path, God's path, leads to. Most of the time, it affects you and I. Can I get an amen? It's painful sometimes. And I want to continue along that theme because, you know, here, here's, here's one thing um, that I need you to walk away with if there's anything that you walk away with today or from this past series, that to the believer... Hope is always alive in the presence of pain and suffering. There is always hope. Turn your neighbor and say, it's always hope, man. Here, here's my definition of pain. It's, it's when my expectation of God does not meet my experience. I'm going to say that one more time. It's when my expectation of God does not meet my experience. 
I'm expecting the God to do something. And, and, and it feels like he didn't. And then pain happens. Suffering happens. And the battleground that most of that happens in, it's right here. It's between your temples. As a man thinketh, the Bible says, so is he. Right, right believing will always read, lead to righteous living. And if you would just think right about your God. My God has better plans. Yes, he does. And most of us, we, we endure pain. And we have this moment sometimes where we go, do you even care, Lord? Do you care? And my answer to you is yes, he does. Are you even looking out for me? You said you would. Do you care? Yes, he does. There's a difference between pain, like you just got a paper cut, pain, and there's a difference between that kind of pain and prolonged pain, when pain just seems to not subside. Somebody asked me, would you rather have physical pain over emotional pain? I said, physical any day of the week, because emotional pain hurts. Here's the thing about prolonged pain, you know, it, it's, it's, it's rooted sometimes. We, we have a tendency to keep beating ourselves up in, in, in this place of prolonged pain. Prolonged pain to me is almost equated to persecuted thinking. Like, oh, why me? Why, 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 why? And it's okay. But stop thinking that on yourself. You have to redirect that to the throne room. The Bible says cast all your cares on him. Can I get a, can I get a witness? It needs to shift off of the weight of me on to him. When you, when you prolong the pain, sometimes we have an, a tendency to embrace our pain more than we do our Savior. And that's where we, we find ourselves on unstable ground because it hurts so much. And the next thing you know, your sand or your foundation is getting shifty, and that's when the enemy comes in and he's poised and ready to bounce. He's just looking for an opening. And most of the time, the opening comes in the framework of pain. When you feel like you're suffering, when you feel like you're hurting, when you feel like, oh my gosh, where are you, Lord? The enemy comes, see, he's not there. See, he doesn't care. See, none of those people at that church that you think are all cool and, and they love you, they don't care. That's when the enemy comes in like a flood. But the Bible says you can take every thought captive and cause it to obey Jesus. You need to take the stronghold and you need to declare it loose. And you submit all your thoughts to Christ. And you just got to let him dictate to you. What I know about uh, prolonged pain is this is when you usually detach from people. Prolonged pain will cause you to detach from people. And that, my friend, is the enemy. Jesus Christ died. He paid the price and he ascended. And you know what that gave birth to? It gave birth to his church. Not the church within the four walls, but the church, the people that are housed within the four walls often. That's what he gave birth to. And the more and more that you feel like my pain is prolonged and it's not happening, it's usually because you've disconnected somehow, some way from his people. Listen to me. Isolation will always intensify your pain, but community will always cure it. The more and more that you withdraw, the more and more that you, you pull away, the more and more you're going to feel more pain. And some of us have it. You don't do it on purpose. Believe me, I've walked this thing. I got, I've been there, done that. I got the T-shirt. I know what it was. I'm not speaking to you from something that I've not experienced. But more and more, some, you just don't even realize you're doing it. Oh, I just, I just, I just need to recover because I can't be happy pastor right now because it all. Oh. And then you withdraw, and you withdraw, and withdraw, and next thing you know, like, why am I such a wreck? It's because the very people that God placed on this planet to encourage you and to lift you up, you've distanced yourself from them. The Bible here in, in, in 1 Peter, now I know I read the paraphrase, but, but here's what he says in the paraphrase. The devil is poised. What does that mean? He's taken position. His position is to wait for you to be on unstable ground. And when you find yourself on unstable ground, your faith begins to become shaky as well. 
And when your faith becomes shaky, then he comes in. He doesn't even come in like dressed up like the devil with pitch horns and a, and a long tail and I'm ready for you. He doesn't do that. He comes in all slick like a serpent just kind of coming in the garden. You'd think nothing of it. And then he poses a question in your head. Is God really for you? He's poised. And if the devil is poised, all the more reason for you and I to stay ready. Turn your neighbor say, stay ready. I've been saying this from, from as long as I've, I've had this pulpit, but you'll never have to get ready if you stay ready. The best time to learn how to swim is not when you're drowning. Can I get an amen? The best time to learn how your parachute works is not when you're already in the air. Can I get an amen? How does this thing work? 500 feet. Bug splat. This is not the time. 2019, and I don't know about you, but everything changed for some reason. The, 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 the world took a turn, and it's very, very interesting how it's turning. To those that believe, you can see it. But those who are on unstable ground, it's hard to see. You know, people from both sides can argue their point. But it doesn't matter what their point is as long as if it's not rooted in God's word and the way that God said it's going to happen, then to me, I don't want any part of it. You can take things and ideas, and sometimes we'll take ideas, uh, 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 theses, theories, and we'll turn them into immutable principles for some reason and we'll go oh that, that that's it that's it that's it that, we need to take that and just that's we need to run with it if it's not rooted in, in the word of God I don't want nothing of it because if it's not rooted in God's word then it causes me to stand on unstable ground the grass withers the flower may fail but the word of God stands forever it's established forever as the rains fall from the sky and water the earth, so shall my word be that proceeds out of my mouth. It will never return to me void. If there's one thing that you can take on and take, take it to the bank, cash it in. It's this check won't bounce. It's you take God's word and you place it into your heart and you begin to walk it out. When you can do that, then you've placed yourself on stable ground. So that when, no matter temptation, no matter trial, no matter suffering, no matter pain that comes your way, you'll still be on solid ground. Because if my expectation of God does not meet my experience, I can always rely on his word. When you fight the devil, when Jesus fought the devil, what did he use? He used the word of God. And, and it's naive to think that you coming on a Sunday, either at a 9.15 or 11.15, or maybe you just say, hey, I'm going to double dip and I'm going to come to both. It's naive to think that you can only come once a week and think that this is enough for me. If the devil is poised and he's got all of his minions ready, looking for an opportunity for you when, when, you're, when you're standing on shaky ground or unstable ground, and then whoop, he swoops right in. All the more reason for you to be on top of it. Can I get an amen? I'm pastoring you today. I want to make sure that, 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 that you don't just hear a ooey gooey word from your pastor, but you, you, you take something that you go, I'm going, to implement this, I'm going to implement this into my life today. I'm going to start walking this out today. You need God's word. I don't want you to eat out of my hand when it comes to the word of God. Start beginning to feed yourself. I don't know about you, but I don't just eat on Sundays. In fact, I think I eat too much. When it comes to the word of God, though, you can never eat too much. Somebody say Amen. So here's what happens. Pain happens. The devil is poised. He sees you on stable ground. And then whoop, he swoops right in. And the one thing that he tries to take out is not your life, not your bank account, not the things of this world, but he tries to take out your faith. Because if he can cause you to not believe in a moment that he's got you, because the things that are happening that cause pain, they look different when it's processed without faith. The more and more that you filter your pain without a lens of faith, it looks worse than it is. But the more and more that you can filter your pain through faith, then you can see the hand of God moving at the same time. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You will never see the comforting hand of God if you remove faith from the equation. You need faith. 
I like how he says it on here because he says, you know, the devil is poised to pounce. He'd like nothing better than to catch you napping, so keep your guard up. And he says this, you're not the only one. You're not the only ones plunged into these hard times. And I need you to understand something because it happens in the context of community. That the person to your left and the person to your right, just because they don't seem to be hurting like you're hurting, it doesn't mean that they've had, they don't have hurt. You're not the only ones. And this is a truth about pain. Pain causes you to go inward and think that it's only happening to me. No, it's not only happened to you. There's other people that's happened to you. The word of God says that. It says there's other people. Those other people, either, they've either walked through it or they're walking through it. Those are the people that you need. So I'm going to give you a couple truths about pain. I'm just going to kind of give this to you off the cuff, all right, because um, I just feel like I want to talk to you from that, that standpoint. Listen to me. Here's a couple truths about pain so you can write these things down. Number one, pain does not grade on a curve. Pain is pain. All pain hurts. Don't sit there and try to make your pain worse than their pain. Don't, also, don't sit there and try to diminish their pain because of your pain. As if, well, I sprained my ankle and so that hurts so bad. And I know that, 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 that you, you, you just had knee surgery, but my pain is, is, hurts more than yours. That's not how it works. Pain is not great on a curve. All pain hurts. It all hurts. The thing that happens when the enemy creeps into your community or to our community is that he will try to tell you that your pain is not like their pain. Well, they don't got the same kind of pain that you do. They don't know. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Pain is pain. Pain doesn't care. Pain, pain doesn't care if it's a, a paper cut or pain doesn't care, care if it's back surgery. Pain is pain. It doesn't care if it's divorce. It doesn't care if it's death. It doesn't care if it's emotional pain. It's all pain. And as a community, as believers in God, you have to be able to look at people and go, hey, man, it's okay. I know pain. I may not have walked through that specifically, but, dude, I'm here for you. If community is what cures pain, then all the more reason for you to embrace the pain. And I know how it is sometimes. I'm a pastor. When my mom passed away, everybody would try to preach to me. Hey, but it's okay. She's with Jesus now. You don't think I know that? Can I punch you in the face every single time you say that to me? I get it that he's with Jesus now. But my flesh wants her to be here with me right now. And allow me some time to process. Just because your pain looks a little different doesn't mean that my pain is worse or less than yours. Pain does not grade on a curve. But here's the thing about pain. Listen to me. The cross covers all pain. He paid for all of it. The pain of missing out. He created an eternity just so that he could be there with them at the end. And we take this momentary thing of pain and we tend to stretch it out. All because we think, and the enemy has kind of gotten in there somehow, that he does not care about you. But yes, he does. I would not stand here today preaching to you from a lens of, of, of you can walk this out. You can get, the, get through this. But you just have to keep walking. You cannot stop. You have to keep moving. It's not a matter of whether I'm going to forget. It's a matter of like, you know what, my healing is over here. And I'm going to link arms with this person to my left and to my right, and my healing is over here. And even though sometimes they're going to say something stupid, they're going to say something dumb, they're going to say something that doesn't make sense, they're only people. But I'd rather have a, a, a shoulder to cry on than to go isolate myself by myself. Pain does not grade on a, uh, on a curve. Listen to me. Also, pain is not in exclusive. Well, I have pain. Y'all don't. Stop it. You know, I wish that you can get a booster shot when you get saved for pain. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm getting my shot today. You know, you won't even cry afterwards. But there's no immunity for pain. But here's the thing about pain, though. Pain actually 
frames you and it shapes you and it identifies you as someone that has been bought by Jesus. Because you can now begin to, to embrace the suffering that Jesus suffered and you can walk out. If you've embraced his suffering, that means you get to walk out his victory. Somebody say amen to that. So wherever there's pain, you know there's going to be victory because of Jesus. And that's why we preach. That's why we keep doing what we're doing to try to reach people. Because we want people to share in the victory, not just in the pain. Non-believers won't have that. They don't see the victory on the other side of the pain. But we do. Listen, pain does not disqualify you. Just because you have pain, it doesn't mean that you're less than of, of a version than you ever were. In fact, to me, when I am weak, he is strong. Sometimes the presence of pain kind of puts in my head that you're weak, you're weak, you're weak, but you need the, God, the word of God to remind you, you know, when I am weak, he is strong. Therefore, I will see the strength of God in my pain. It does not disqualify me. In fact, it even qualifies me in that space right there. I have something to say because I have what I've just walked through. I have something to say because I'm walking through. And my victory is on the other side of my experience. If I want to, faith is all expectation in what God is going to do. My expectation does not diminish because of a moment of pain. He is, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Which means he's never changing. The same God that was for you before you experienced your pain is the same God that's going to be there for you after you walk it out. And when you, when you get to heaven and you meet him face to face, he's going to be right there, right there for you. Pain does not disqualify you. Pain can never heal you. I think someone needs to hear that. We have a tendency sometimes to embrace our pain more than we do our Savior. It becomes a badge of honor for us sometimes. But you need to understand something. Pain can never heal you. But because of the Lord, you can be healed from your pain. Pain can never heal you, but you have the ability to be healed from your pain. So rather than owning your pain... I'm going to own the healer. Rather than owning my hurt, I'm going to own my Savior. Rather than owning my suffering, I'm going to look to the one who is for me and not against me. That from the beginning of time, he's preordained it that I become part of his family. And if I'm part of his family, then I'm part of a kingdom that is not going to be shaken. Can I get a witness? Pain is not where you hold on to. Pain, slowly, over time, you're going to learn how to release. And you're going to learn that you can look at it and realize that this does not own me. My pain does not own me. I have an experience of pain, but it doesn't identify who I am, which is, brings me to the last point. Pain is not an identity. It's a season. You are not your pain. You know, my man over here to my left, he's a cancer survivor. He's walked through cancer. You're, 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 you're not a cancer patient anymore. I am a cancer survivor. Whether on this side of eternity it's going to happen or the other side. That is not my identity. You know what my identity is? My identity is that I'm a child of God. My identity is that... I'm God's favorite kid. I don't know about y'all, but he, I'm his favorite kid. That needs to be your identity, not your pain. Pain does not define you. At some point, you need to stand firm, plant your feet, and go, no, devil, not today. Stop even creeping around in there, walking around like you got some kind of stake in my head. No, get out in Jesus' name. The Bible says submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Most of the time, we just try to resist God, but you have to submit to him. How will you know what to submit to if you don't have the word inside of you? You need to be able to submit to God. Then you're equipped to resist the devil. Because now you're equipped with the water of the word of God. And every fiery dart that comes at you, like Captain America lifting up his shield. Nope, not today. 
Not today. Not today. Listen to me. Your pain is not forever. It's a when. It's a moment. Jesus would tell Peter, said, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. And sifting, when you put it in the context of humanity, it's pain. You ever seen what it looks like? They would have a threshing floor where they would have all the wheat laid out on this threshing floor. They would take these big old like broomsticks or whatever they call them, and they would beat them down. They would take these things and go, just to shake it loose. I don't know about you, but sometimes my life feels like it's being, and they would take those little things, they'd remove all the husks, and they'd put it in a little basket, and they would shake it, and they would sift everything. Some of them would even set up a fan. So that the chaff would blow away and that you're just left with wheat. But here's the thing. In moments like that, those things are not meant to sift you out. It's meant to prove you. Because even Jesus said it to Simon. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. And Jesus' prayer did not stop. He, He is your advocate. He's your attorney. He's still making petition to his father on behalf of you. He's saying, no, 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 That's, I paid that price, Lord. I paid that price, the price for him, God. I paid the price for her, God. There's a victory on this other end. Watch. And here you are. You come out of this better than ever. And when Jesus says he's prayed for you, he even gives you purpose right there. And he changes your when. It's not of when you're suffering. It's when you have been strengthened, when you've returned. When you have returned. He's prophesying over your life before you even realize that he was. Satan's trying to take you out, man, but Jesus is up there praying for you. And when you have come back, you turn to your neighbor and say, I'm coming back. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I'm alive. It's not a when. Your pain is not an identity. It's a when. When? But you can choose to frame your whens, and you can choose to own your whens. When you have returned, which means I'm going to return. I'm going to turn again. And he gives him purpose. When you come back, when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Which means that what I just walked out of, I got something to use to strengthen you. I want to backtrack a little bit because he says, you know, keep a firm grip on your faith. And I want you to listen to me when it comes to this. You got to hold on to your faith. That's the thing that you need to grip on. Not, not a matter of, okay, I need to get my financial situation handled, you know, because this needs to happen. I need to go buy this and stuff. And, you know, I got to buy formula for the kids, diapers for the kids, you know, all this stuff. Yeah, that, that's good. That's stewarding what God has given you. But don't ever hold on with a loose grip, your faith. You're meant to keep a firm grip on your faith. Listen, faith can falter, but faith should not fail. It's okay to to, to stumble and fall. It's not okay to not get back up. It's okay to, to get tripped up. And I pray that that happens more infrequently as you grow in the Lord. But if you get tripped up, don't let the devil shame you from getting back up. Here's what I believe happens is when you get tripped up and you get back up, you know, all of a sudden when you, by faith, I'm getting back up, Lord. I know I messed up, but I'm getting back up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this over again with you. I'm going to start walking upright the way that you called me to, uh, to walk. Then all of a sudden your foundation changes. The ground that you're standing on becomes a little bit more flat. And the next thing you know, I could do this. But when you fall and you go, you know what, I quit. This following Jesus is too hard. It's messing with my love life. This pastor over here is telling me to give, and you know, it's messing with my bank account. And these people, I don't know why they keep crying when we're singing songs. We're just singing songs. Why y'all crying? It's messing with my reality a little bit. I quit. That's when the devil got you. That's when your life is going to go crazy. I, I've, I've been at this position now for, for over 10 years, and everyone that I've seen leave and not follow anymore, 
their lives have taken a very dark turn. Because you've left what you once known is real. You can't unknow that God is real. Try it. You're going to be messed up. Well, no, don't try it. What am I saying? Don't even mess around with that stuff. <laughs> don't go there. But you have to keep a firm grip on your faith. You know, I, those of you guys that have, have heard me talk about I ride, I've, I've gotten into road biking, and I ride my bike all the time now. And so I usually take a, a ride down Horizon Ridge towards Acacia Park, and I can easily go like 24 miles an hour on a bicycle, like easily. But, you know, I got kids that I got to raise, and I got, <laughs> I got a, a wife I want to go home to. I ain't trying to be evil Knievel up in here and be a, 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 a crazy guy and Lance Armstrong. So I keep a loose, like, grip on my, uh, on my brake because, like, once I see the speedometer going a little too fast, I'm like, ooh, we got to slow down a little bit because the ground is often uneven sometimes. And if you've ever seen road bikes, tires are really, really skinny. You hit the wrong kind of pebble, boulder, next thing you know, your pastor is flying like Superman across uh, Horizon Ridge. I ain't down with that. And so sometimes I'll be riding and I'll have my hand just kind of loose, just ready to, to, to uh, hit the brake. But sometimes there's times where I'll hit like a little, like, I don't know, imperfection in the road, so to speak. And then, I kid you not, my bike jars. It just and then it feels like my hands come off of the handlebars. Scary, scary feeling. Because you're going 24 miles an hour, and it's, you know, poof, oh, I don't have anything to hold on to. It's just like your faith. You can't keep a loose grip on your faith. You need to be holding on to something because you never know when a little imperfection in the world happens, and boom, next thing you know, it takes you out. And you start to... And the next thing you know, you're laying on the ground. They might be, for me, they might as well draw a chalk outline around me because I ain't get back up no more. That hurts. So let me give you two things before we close here. How do I keep a firm grip on my faith? I don't want to just tell you to keep a firm grip on your faith. I'm going to give you some tools here because this is what the Bible is saying. It says in the very beginning, it says keep a cool head. In other words, stay cool. I'm not just saying that just because it sounds cool, <laughs> but keep cool. What does that mean? Be sober-minded. What does that mean? Does it mean, like, no drinking? Well, whatever, is, uh, whatever first comes into your head, maybe, maybe you need to think about that. Being sober-minded means that you have a clear mind. What I've realized is that sometimes when I'm moving forward, if I've pigeonholed my expectation of what God is going to do, oftentimes I'm disappointed. You need to be able to move with clarity. And, and, and what does that mean? Well, endeavor yourself to always stay free from having a polluted mind. Stop allowing things in your mind that will change your judgment about who God is. Listen. I'm going to piggyback, uh, piggyback off of what uh, Sarah was preaching yet, uh, last Sunday. But she was talking on holiness. To me, clarity of mind is the fruit of holiness. When you can begin to walk a line of holiness, you know, being holy. The Bible says, be holy as I am holy. It's a being that you can be. It's not a doing. He didn't say do holy. He said be holy. And when God says stuff, it's true. He's telling you to be holy because you have the wherewithal and you have the possibility that you can walk out holiness. So he says, be holy. As a result of your holiness, clarity of mind happens. You'll begin to have an understanding and seeing how things work. If you look at Solomon, he was the wisest man in all of the kingdom of God, of all the kings that, that God has ever ordained of Israel. He was the wisest king to ever live. And the wisest king would always say, and this is a, a proverb, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. You need to have a healthy perspective of who God is, and then your mind will be clear. So turn your ear and say, keep cool. Second thing is you got to stay alert. How do I keep a firm grip on my faith? I got to keep cool. 
and I got to stay alert. Why? Because the devil is poised to try to take me out. He's taken ground. He's got position. He's ready. He's like Daniel in the Karate Kid. He's already got the pose going. He's just waiting to crane kick you in the head when you're not looking. You have to stay alert. You have to be vigilant. You have to be watchful. He says you don't want to get caught napping. Well, so what? I can't take a nap? No. Embrace God's rest, but don't fall asleep when it comes to your faith. You can embrace God's rest. God created seven days, and out of the seven day, on the seventh day, God created rest. You have to embrace rest. And what is rest? What does that look like? Does that mean that I can't do nothing? Like, no. Resting in God is delighting in God. That's the time when, you know, when me and the kids go, go to the harvest festivals on those days. My, when, when my wife and I will, will just go on, on a random day date or on, on, on an evening date. Delight in what God has created. That's embracing rest. You forsaking God on your day of vacation and on your day of whatever, that's, that's healthy for your, your, your body, but it's not nurturing your soul. You have to embrace God's rest. Here's why. Is because in the moment that you're embracing God's rest, you're still walking according to his. Rest is not retreating from God's plans. Sometimes we treat it like that. Well, you know, I'm just, I'm going to rest. So I'm not going to go to church. I'm going to rest, so I'm not going to go to the small group. And then during that week, you wonder why you're just like a wreck. You're angry all the time. You're short with your, with, with your family all the time. Maybe it's because you didn't embrace God's rest. You stop being vigilant. You stop being watchful. If you got kids, you know what it's like. Oh, boom, 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 put that, put, put the cookie down. And what, what are you, what are you doing? Sometimes we'll just catch my kids just opening the pantry, just like, what are you doing? I'm cooking dinner. I was about to just go get a fruit. Like, no, no fruit roll-ups in Jesus' name. You got to be vigilant. You got to watch. You got to keep an eye out. You got to, where's the blind spots in my life? Because I guarantee you, if, you, if you're just loosey-goosey with your faith, then there's all kinds of blind spots all over you. Listen. How, how do you stay alert? I'm going to go back to what he said about when. This is when you have returned, when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. You got to be purposeful about those wins. When you're purposeful about your wins, then you're good. God, you're going to see you're going to see what shouldn't be there and what needs to be there. Make every win count towards your purpose in God. For me, the way that it looks, I choose to live out my purpose on purpose. I'm going to say that again. I'm choosing to live out my purpose on purpose. God has purposed me to be a husband, right? So I'm going to live that out on purpose. I'm not going to take that for granted. That's me being watchful. That's me staying vigilant. I've been purposed to raise kids. It's pretty soon, I'm going to be purposed to raise and break, you know, hair for a grandkid granddaughter so i'm gonna live out that purpose what on purpose stop taking your life for granted and going okay well if it happens cool if it doesn't happen cool that's okay an outlook but you got to make sure that you're still walking in line with what god has purposed you to walk out to me there's a lot of blessings to be had but i want to be aware of what is not from him and i want to be aware of what is from him somebody say amen